What's up guys? So, this is the video of the stream that I did with Comrade Net uh, concerning um, an issue that the trans community needs to needs to talk about, have a discussion about, and frankly a person that needs to be called out for very um, concerning behavior. Um, and that was the issue of Jeffrey Marsh. Um, so that was what this stream was about. Uh, me and Comrade Net had a pretty good discussion about it, and this is it. So, without much further ado, let's play it. <laughs> <laughs> we are live, everybody. At least I think we are. Um, I said that before when I tried this. So let me just make sure that I really am live. Oh, I am live. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So <laughs> I'm joined with a guest here, uh, Red Pagan Nicole. Hello. Hello. Um, and we are confronting something that's making it difficult for leftists who believe in things like democracy and coexistence. Um, their name is Jeffrey Marsh. Um, so Jeffrey Marsh was public, uh, was publicly criticized by a Muslim co comedian critic. Uh, she called Jeffrey out. Um, she even used the correct pronouns, which I do believe are they, them. Um, Jeffrey Marsh has been criticized before, but when a Muslim woman criticized, you know, them, uh, this resulted in basically gender warriors, which I don't think is an official term, but like that's a term usually referring to hyper fanatical people who attack everybody as transphobic. Um, but basically the gender warriors came in, started harassing her, you know, um, and, you know, her car was vandalized. Uh, they took they they found pictures of her, but you know, without her hijab, they um, involved her daughter in this. And you know, um, there's been quite a bit of a backlash over this. And I, I will say that I know uh, I know for a fact that not all Muslims are transphobic. In fact, a great deal of them are not. However, the re the religion of Islam doesn't necessarily leave a lot of room for this kind of, you know, um, thing. Um, and I'm afraid that this is closing it off, like this could close it off for a long, long time because a lot of Muslims, you know, as they haven't had a lot of interaction with trans people, if this is what they see, I'm afraid that they are gonna mark the whole community this way. I was asked by Muslims, uh, because I have Muslim family members, I was asked by Muslims to talk about this, and I don't want to foster further divisions. So I sought help from probably one of the smartest allies I know, Nicole, you know, Red Pagan. And, you know, um, by the way, Jeffrey Marsh is on TikTok. He recently came, sorry, they, uh, I apologize. They recently came said i think you know like provocative stuff to incite the muslim community even i i may not i'm not quite too sure it's hard to follow um but jeffrey marsh even said that god looks like me now if you're anybody that's jewish or muslim yeah, yeah god has no form so like you know it's, it's obvious what's going on here but you know i will let you pick this up now nicole yeah um i actually was not even aware of uh Jeffrey Marsh until uh, quite recently and um, after reviewing uh, the content uh, in which he's done he comes off or they sorry they come off as um, very very cult like very very um, just and just very creepy in a, in a lot of ways. And speaking as a trans woman myself, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't want to foster any further, like, fuel to the fire that a lot of 
the right wing has um, already done to trans people and with the idea of, you know, grooming rumors. But the fact really remains that um, Jeffrey Marsh is uh, very, it has a very suspicious sort of context to his videos and, um, or to their videos, and uh, it's just, to me, it just seems very, um, it, ju it, it just comes off as, as very suspicious, uh, that, you know, their, their entire, um, just, the, and just the fact that they are, um, just the, the fact that they're working very closely with kids and stuff like that, this person does give off very, as much as I hate to say it, it gives off very much pedophilic uh, vibes. And I'm not accusing Jeffrey of anything. I am just simply stating that from my perspective, this person is problematic for the trans community, for the non-binary community. And yes, and that's why I have wanted to speak out on the issue. Um, and uh, Comrade Net actually had reached out and I had um, agreed to do this because I believe in fighting you know, fighting pedophiles, you know, in our community. And we do have certain people that are problematic and those people do not represent the trans community. And we should seek, the, seek them out and, um, and expose them for who they really are. And so, yeah, that's, kind of what I really what I have to say as far as that goes <laughs> okay um, yeah very much uh, appreciated uh, like I said before I'm concerned with the way that this has fostered division I mean it's it's difficult sometimes when people ask me about my politics because like I hesitate often to say I'm leftist which I am a leftist far left in fact but you know like anybody who's on the far left knows that part of the agenda of being on the far left is to far left is to destroy the paradigm altogether um because it, it is a measure of control the, the left is the margin so that's the whole point of the left you know and um the center left is more of a new thing i would say the same with the center right the, you know the, the the far left and far right are results of of this of the centers of left and right um, cause there, there is a, there is a dead center, which I think is dying actually, but you know, like you have a lot of the center left dominates, uh, the, the better, the better leftist platforms. They dodge, they, they'll go, they, they look really radical until you notice they dodge a lot of important, um, things. Uh, a primary example I would give of this is the fact that Dr. Weisfeld has all the credibility and credentials to be on democracy now but he's not he's never on democracy now of course democracy now also refuses to uh to uh, interview nature carta um which is problematic uh, you know and i think it's because dr weisfeld has never agreed with the two-state solution and because he is a hardcore anti-zionist you know um i mean he doesn't even necessarily call for the uh, expulsion of uh, quote israelis um I mean, he, 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 I mean, actually, I have a book with me. Um, it's called the, uh, hold on, let me see. Like, I, I have it, and, and I'm just, I get nervous sometimes when streaming. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm a very odd person, that's been told to me. You know, I'm, I, I think I'm getting better with presentation, but, you know, like, I, I get nervous, and then I become forgetful things just out of being nervous yeah yeah of course i, I should know this by now like, the federation of palestinian and hebrew nations i have this book um and i would like to write a book report on this but like it will take it would take me a whole year to write a book report on this because this is a very uh condensed well detailed book on how to deal with the zionist problem you know and the thing is is dr weisfeld 
you could you could say that he's got a bad line on this or that he's he's wrong about China and all kinds of stuff. And I would largely agree with those positions, but he is of the far left. He does concede to the correct positions when it's been proven. And you know, he's not allowed on democracy now, for crying out loud. <laughs> and I think part of the other thing is is because he he um like me has quite a bit of connection to the Muslim community and he could explain things and he had you know he's commented combat combated anti-semitism both judeophobic and islamophobic uh, i am seeing not throughout the entire trans community but i am seeing islamophobia growing amongst them i am seeing transphobia amongst you know the muslim community all because of what jeffrey marsh did you know like um I, does this concern you, the kind of division this has, especially because Muslims are coming into the left now? Yeah, um, it's one of those things where, you know, um, our uh, Islamic brothers and sisters have always had a place within our within our community. And it's one of those things that for me, I do find this issue with um with Jeffrey Marsh to be very problematic and it is sowing a lot of division um, with, you know, between the trans community and the Islamic community. And it's, I think that some of the, and, and a lot of the Islamophobia is coming from a lot of these people that do not seem to understand just the it, just how problematic Jeffrey Marsh really actually is, and the, you know either that or they 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 just refuse to say it. Um, on the other end, there's you know people in the Islamic community who might not understand the whole like trans thing. And, you know, might have like preconceived notions um, about trans people. And I can honestly say the same thing for the trans community um, with their Islamophobia. There's probably a lot of ignorance and a lot of uh, misconceptions about Muslims that they don't understand. So I think at what it comes down to is is ignorance and lack of understanding lack of education possibly on the subject on the two subjects and um just with but on in on the side of the trans community it is large you know they are attacking muslims you know simply thinking that they are transphobic when it is that may or may not be the actual case the real problem is there is a person that is problematic in our community they've been called out for it and you know and all of a sudden that that's become an issue i'm sorry but it's just one of those things where we as trans people need to be able to self-criticize our own community and ex you know expose and essentially to get not necessarily get rid of but es essentially tell you know tell people that these you know these x people do not represent us it's like they, their gender you know identity is valid but that doesn't take away from the fact that they are you know that they are you know problematic people that you know do not deserve our love respect you know or acceptance because that you know they yeah just because of of who they who they are and what and what they're doing so um yeah, at the end of the uh, so I think that that's my biggest my biggest issue is I think it is the lack of understanding of the context that is currently being given and 
a lack of understanding for each other's communities. <laughs> Well said, um, you know, and and this uh, this this brings up um, something else that um, I thought it before, but you know the the um, the world. I mean, I mean, just by you speaking about this, this has brought this to mind. The world is coming of age. I've noticed, like literally, it's coming to age. Like everybody has to deal with everybody else now. You know, um, I and I don't think that you can just say that that's the internet. I think the internet was what allowed it to start up. But like, as they're centralizing the internet, people are, since particularly COVID, people are deciding to network. I think COVID showed, exposed people, to pe particularly people in the first world. I think that it, sh it, it showed us ourselves and how alienated we are from one another and the value of human contact over having to always go on Skype, you know, like became a thing for people. You know, I I have no problem with connecting with someone online and getting to know them through online over time. But in my experience, um, like for instance, with the Bundist movement, anybody I tried to bring into the Bundist movement that I knew online was never solid. Every Everybody that stuck with it, I mean, the ones that stuck with it are now dead, but they, 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 they were people that I, um reached out to in person you know and this is becoming something we're all becoming more conscious of is that you know in-person contact is valuable part of this also stems to the fact that we could say that trans as it is today the phenomena is a bit more different but the phenomena itself is very ancient actually mm -hmm. this is very ancient um i i feel like such an idiot because i actually asked jason to look this up for me but there's a place <laughs> I believe it's in India where there has been consistent trans people, you know, because like when you look through antiquity, uh, what we call today trans has come and gone many times, but in some areas of the world, it's been always, always consistent. One of them is a place in India that I cannot remember. I really can't remember what it's called. And, uh, and I feel bad about that because that you, you can point to that as an example because of how consistent it's always been there. Um, Yeah, there's um, actually one example of um, of a trans woman uh, from Roman times, and that is um, Elagabalus, the um, what I like to refer to as Empress of Rome, um, because she was very much so um, a woman that um, was a person that. Um, dressed in women's clothes she actually was um uh, married to a man and uh preferred to be referred to by you know by you know the female uh pronouns and um the different and the female titles and actually um had um put out a reward for anybody that could essentially um essentially give her bottom surgery which you know obviously was very much a thought process you know far uh far removed from its uh you know way 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 ahead of its time but um yeah um but that is definitely a, a good ancient example of a figure from history who was very very obviously a trans woman and while historians want to, you know, still debate it, the facts are kind of there. She was, she was, a, she was a woman. She felt like a woman. Therefore, she should be referred to as, as a woman and by female pronouns. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, okay, so now this, this gets into another thing. Um... I decide, I toyed with this idea of whether I should bring this up, but I should I, I should bring this up. One of the things that um, often will make people uncomfortable is that the separation of gender and sex, um, sex referring to male and female, gender being like man and woman and what else. But like if you get into the Kabbalah, for instance, um, there was only man originally. And I'm not even talking about it 
the Adam and Eve split. I'm talking about before Adam. If you get into it, um, Adam was created Adam and Lilith. The pronoun was he. The Hebrew word for he is who, by the way. Um, <laughs> but but um, the pronoun was he. For Lilith included, and Lilith was definitely female. Because it because if you read it in Genesis, the creation of man is done twice. First man is created, and he's created both male and female. And then the second time he's created, he's alone. And then you need, you know, uh, and then Eve is uh, pulled out of him. Eve, Eve, people think that Eve uh, came from a rib. That's a really bad mistranslation. Um, it, I, I don't remember how you say it in Hebrew, but it, what it actually says is that a side from Adam was taken out. And this was done while Adam was sleeping. So Eve's creation comes from a dream. Like if you get like, and, and that's, and I'm very skeptical of Judaism without the Kabbalah because Judaism speaks in very esoteric terms uh, throughout the book of Genesis or, or Breshet in Hebrew or Breshet in, in Yiddish. Um, and, you know, there's several times esoteric context, uh, concepts are mentioned. But if we think about that, the pre-gender Adam is there before there is the separation of man and woman. You know, so, um, and this is why queer conservative ox Judaism is, is becoming extremely popular because, you know, in fact, I know, or I, well, I used to know um, them. Uh, I, I knew a person who became a rabbi for the, the Jewish queer conservative ox communities. Uh, there's several, I should say communities, because there's actually several of these communities. And they had told me that they um, considered certain forms of Orthodox Judaism to be part of the queer community. And, and that gets into another thing that the queers will often accept people who don't even necessarily, necessarily consider themselves queer because like I found out that anybody who's neurodivergent, the queer community will accept you just because of the high mm -hmm. level of persecution and ostracizing that comes with being neuro, neurodivergent. And, and then there's a the question, is it even really a mental illness or is this a ma manifestation in consciousness that we don't understand? What you, you had something to tell me. I had asked if you considered autism a uh, mental illness and you, you gave a very different answer, if you could give that answer. Yeah, um, so basically we our understanding of autism, first of all, has come a long way. Um, there was once a, a time where we referred to it as low functioning, high functioning. Um, and that's no longer the case. We kind of realize that autism is kind of not really linear. It's more of kind of a circle. It's kind of almost fluid in a lot of ways, kind of like how sexuality and gender is in a way fluid. Um, in my case, you know, under the old definition, I would be considered um, high functioning in that, that I very much so, you know, am able to, you know, I, I, I'm able to hold a job. I'm able to, you know, converse with people. I'm able to, you know, carry myself pretty well. Um, but, um, but there are people that are, you know, what would have been referred to um, as low functioning who, you know, basically have, have a lot of problems and disabilities and stuff like that um, with just getting along in, li in life and that they, they need, they do actually need, you know, care. Um, but, you know, so yeah, aut but autism isn't just black and white it's not saying that somebody has a developmental disorder it doesn't mean that some or somebody is you know basically can mask it you know in the way that say i can autism is it is it is definitely very fluid and in my case i consider it to be in a way, a superpower, and basically the way you had kind of described it is that it's, we, we basically have come to the, we, we don't know enough about autism um, to the point where, you know, I mean, we've come a long way from like 20, 20, 30 years ago when we knew absolute jack shit about it, but now we've gotten to the point where we have some understanding, but we don't 
really know the, really the level of what it might be. We could find out that autism might actually be some sort of a evolutionary mutation or something. Because the way I look at it, it's my autism is a superpower. I hyperfixate on a lot of things, particularly knowledge and politics. And yeah, that while it's one of those things that that means that, you know, I don't maintain focus with a lot of other subjects or a lot of other particular topics, I still it it makes me good at what I do. And one of the thing and that's one of the reasons why not only do am I able to absorb this knowledge quite easily, but then I also, you know, like to talk about it. I like to share that knowledge. And that's one of the reasons why I when I came back to YouTube, I wanted to basically be see my I, I basically saw myself as a person that wanted to educate people. So in a way I consider myself a teacher, an educator. And um and I feel that in in a way my autism actually helps me, not hinders me. And this is kind of the part where I'm where I had mentioned just a few minutes ago about how we don't know enough about autism yet uh, to say for certain whether it, it, it technically is a disability or it's not. It could very well be for some people it is a disability, but for others it could also be an evolutionary mutation that maybe this is a higher plane of thought. Maybe that, you know, people have a different functionality on how they see the world and um or how they process knowledge and um yeah like i said we just don't know we you know there's you know always ongoing studies about it um but i think that we have at least a better understanding of what of how you know about autism than we did if about 20 30 years ago but there definitely is um certain um there still is ableism out there and there still is you know misconceptions about autism and i and a lot of that just comes from the fact that a lot of people don't you know they still don't understand what autism is and basically the, i view it as you know a very you know broad fluid you know sort of a thing you know there are people that are more that you know that you know have a that would be categorized as having a disability but then there are some like me that you know are you know are consider it you know a an advantage actually <laughs> yeah um yeah um and, and you know it's kind of funny because you know like, as we had talked yeah as we had talked about it before um there was such a gross misunderstanding about how what it was and how it worked like anybody who's seen the the, the, the show rain man would know what i'm talking about that's what i thought autism was pure and simple and then my firstborn child turned out to be autistic and i felt like an idiot because i was like oh my gosh this, this explains everything now <laughs> um and uh, i mean anybody who wants to on on my channel you can see um i did two interviews with super mom of psfm the first one i did just titled super mom uh we talk about uh having neurodivergent children because she has a, a neurodivergent child um and i think that one of the things that is you think would actually help the trans and queer community that, 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 that like there's, there's an, I'm not saying that this is what stem, what it caught, what it, where it's from or what makes it, but there's an obvious, um, a correspondence between, uh, neurodivergency and, um, trans and queer. Um, and again, it's not to say that that's exactly where it stems from, but you, 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 you would think, um, that this would help, uh, with the credibility and and to and to a lot of people it does help with the credibility of this but uh, uh, of, of you know transness and queerness but 
certain people are using this as cannon fodder. And I think it's because of ableism and how bad ableism is. Like you could not even have an illness and you no know, ableism could apply to you, you know, like the attacks of ableism because of just, let's be honest, we're, we're living in a very chauvinistic world right now. You know, um, hate is more on the rise, not in the decline. Um, and, you know, um, that's why that's why me and Nicole here, you know, we agreed to go basically confront um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey's making everything worse. Um, you know, if you think that Islamophobia is not real, you're not paying attention. And if you think transphobia isn't the decline, no, I'll tell you what I know in Arizona, especially since COVID, transphobia is on the rise out here. <laughs> It's on the rise. It's getting worse. Yeah, in fact, I uh, believe that there is a currently a currently a, a bill um, going through. Uh, I mean, there's several bills across different states, but one of them is in Arizona, and it's to um, essentially um, ban gender affirming care um, to. Uh, basically to trans kids to people under 18 and um they've already done it in um they're already they've already done it in a couple of states and there are and there there's many bills on the table to uh to do that in i believe it's missouri nebraska um florida i believe just banned it uh texas is trying to and probably will succeed in banning it um, and then that's just on gender affirming care. Then you've got, of course, states like Tennessee that are uh, that have banned uh, banned. Essentially, they've it's a drag ban, but the the language states male and female impersonators, which essentially means they're banning trans people. And a similar uh, bill is on uh, the table in Texas um, that is pretty much mirrors the Tennessee uh, the Tennessee law, and um, you know the, you know I am thankful that and I've I've stated this on Twitter that th there's you, there's different levels of privilege that we all that. You know, of course, there's white privilege, which, you know, we talk um, to, you know, in, in great detail about, um, especially these days, especially when it comes to, um, you know, issues with, with ra um, racial injustice and everything. But one of the things that we don't talk about is privilege amongst trans people and when i talk about privilege amongst trans people one of the things that i mention is in my particular uh, particular case i was born in california particularly the bay area so i was so i come from a pretty liberal part of the country and then i moved about five years ago to uh, portland oregon um, which, you know, is of course known for being kind of almost protest, you know, one of the protest capitals because it was, um, the, one of the major focal points for a lot of major news outlets during, um, the George Floyd protests and everything. So I, you, when you kind of really look at Cascadia and California and just the West coast in general, it's broadly you know the people in the in a lot of these cities are you know pretty pretty progressive at, you know at, you know at bare at bare minimum and you will have definitely some socialists some anarchists and leftists in general that exists some you know within these cities but then you go like outside of those cities like you go across the mountains into like the town of lapine or go over to uh you know or you um head up the mountains of california towards um you know places like amador placer um you know those counties up in the foothills those all those places become very conservative 
and my family actually lives up in those foothills now so whenever i go back home i get you know i i, I don't i haven't ever been attacked or have had anybody say anything to me but i feel way more judgment when i go back home not from my family, but from the community that exists there. But that being said, because of where I was born, raised, and now where I currently live, I have a I, I come from a, a slight position of privilege because I don't face nearly the discrimination that a lot of tra other trans people do. I will never face the you know the insane amount of discrimination that say a trans woman in florida or texas would face or even arizona because i'm you know because i live in a pretty in a pretty safe area so um and that's something that i i have to constantly uh, acknowledge and I have to be honest with myself and with others that I talk to and sometimes I have to uh, as the old saying goes check my privilege um, every once in a while because I will get into debates with trans people on certain issues and have to um, re take a step back and realize okay I maybe maybe I'm not really understanding their point of view because of my position so it's and um and that's and that's perfectly fine that that that's part of that whole self critique that's that you know that's what makes us you know that's what makes us better people at the end of the day is being able to recognize that and um yeah no but transphobia does still very much exist um you know it, it just it, you know it all you it's just all you have to do is go outside of major city centers and you'll find and you'll easily find it and you know that and in places like arizona like texas like you know florida or any place like that yeah there's going to be a lot of loud obnoxious people but you go within their like city centers and stuff like that you know people are you know fairly you know fairly progressive fairly accepting of of um trans people but you go out into those those rural areas it, it's a whole it's a whole new ball game <laughs> yeah um yeah no it, like it's 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 very visible the phobia um, and it's not that trans people in Arizona are invisible. Trans people in Arizona, like you have the ones who are going to make it clear, which does not make them, that doesn't make them flamboyant or, you know, too showy. Like I would say if the, you hold that position, that would definitely be transphobia if, if that's how you think. Um, but you also have a lot of them who try to hide it. The, the irony is I've noticed that out here it's harder I mean, it would be harder for trans men to hide it because a lot of them will take the hormones and then they'll develop the facial hair. And then, you know, some people will realize that this person is trans or not. Um, and I don't have any right to weigh on, on which trans, which group within the trans community has it worse than the others. In my experience, I, I, and this is just my experience, and, and I have, I may have my own opinions about this. So, I mean, but I would withhold because as a cisgender man, I really don't have like the sharp angle to make an affirming claim. But what I have seen is that trans men get it very rough. Um, in fact, they're the most atomized of the trans people. Um, um, and, and that wouldn't really matter whether they're non-binary or, or, or or not non-binary. I don't know what the uh, term for someone who's not non-binary is, but like it wouldn't fucking matter, honestly, because the result is largely the same. Um, you know, I've always—I'm not a dude, bro. All 
All right. <laughs> and I've said before, it's okay to be a dude. It's okay to be a bro. It's just not okay to be a dude, bro. You know, and, and th these are just words and common speak, but bro, dude, bro is a reference to somebody who's overly jock. Like, I think, you know, someone who's, you know, the alpha male type. Yeah. 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 And so I do, um, have more of a dude attitude. I wouldn't say bro. Like I say bro and I have bros, but <laughs> referring to me exactly as a bro wouldn't be accurate unless you're using it in the context of comrades. Right. Um, referring to me more as a dude would be more accurate because, you know, like a, a, a dude is an average schmo, basically, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so my approach has always been with trans men to speak dude to them. They're very, you know, usually they're very receptive to that. Um, and when you look at how other people approach them, like there's a certain brain deadness that, that occurs. Like people don't know how to try it, like in Arizona particularly. Um, and I'm probably, you know, like, uh, like uh, I I'm probably talking about Glendale the most. I mean, this is a problem in the city of Phoenix, but the city of Glendale, oh, it's really, it's really bad over there. Like you, you notice people do not approach them in any sincere matter, you know, like, I can understand that the concept confuses you um, because like before I fully understood what I would say, I still don't fully understand, but before I had any understanding of the trans community, I was definitely confused, but I didn't come at it from a place of hate. I, I asked questions and, you know, um, at a certain point I stopped asking questions because I was afraid to, because like I would say, I would say in the, uh, especially the mid 2010s, gender warriors were dominating that whole conversation you ask questions you were transphobic you know um come to find out when you talk to like a poor trans people um i i hear more not often than not no it's good that you're asking questions um but i've noticed that you know basically i, I put two and two together if trans men are men then i should speak to them as men that usually is how to deal with that you know um but like they don't, they're the first to get, trans men I've noticed are the first to get fired in the gas stations, booted out for ridiculous reasons, often for no reason at all. And because it's a right to work state, there's no real way to combat it. That's, yeah, you could go to the labor board, but the labor board it, it doesn't care. Uh, the labor yeah. board in Arizona is completely transphobic, still homophobic. I mean, they, they have to be careful with the homophobic part, but, but they are still very much homophobic. Um, a good deal of it is very Islamophobic. Um, you know, the labor bo board in Arizona is not something that is going to help. I, I know I'm not trying to try to create a disparity here, but like, it's just the simple reality of it. Um, a great deal of the homeless slump and proletariat in Arizona is trans, um, among the lumpenized employees. A lot of them, you know, are, are trans, like a, a good deal of the Uber drivers are, are now trans. You know, the, 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 it's it, trans people tend to be, I'm not saying all trans people are lumpen proletarians, but I am saying that I, I'm more of the position that the majority of them are um, because of the way that they're locked out. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want what Jeffrey Marsh has done to caught you know continue to cause division um and i don't want more jeffrey marshes to go you know like unchecked and i also don't want among jewish people and and muslims for you know a lack of understanding to continue um i think i think with jewish people we have a higher capacity to get it for the reasons i mentioned like you get into the cabal there is there's an actual frame of reference we can pull for for this you know um it's not to say that it's impossible in Islam. I just think that the way Islam is denied, there isn't much wiggle room. There are like Muslim trans people, but for them on the, on the, in the trans community, that's a contradiction. And for the Muslims, the majority of them, that's a contradiction, you know? So imagine how somebody who remains Muslim, because that's, you know, it, it, religiosity really is a matter of orientation. It's not something you can just wipe away, you know? And if this person is also trans, like, I would be also most concerned for them. Um, you know, they, 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 you know, this, this, this thing is that there are 
trans women and trans men, trans women like yourself, for instance, who have repeatedly called out predators, gender warriors, and all these things that really don't help. And a lot of people feel like there's not enough. I can understand that it's fear, but I, I'll tell you this on, um, since there is a parallel, like a literal parallel you could draw from Judeophobia and transphobia. Um, I remember in the, remember the and even in the, two, in the, in the 2010s, how difficult it was to call out Zionists and uh, Jewish aristocrats that were ripping off Jewish people and Gentiles alike. And it was always, you're going to hurt the Jewish community by speaking of it. And I always took the opposite position. I was like, no, if we don't call out Zionists, uh, 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 greedy Jewish aristocrats and the Jewish bourgeoisie, it's not going to help us. It only will make it worse because we're denying that our community can have issues like any other community. Now today, I am happy to say, at least when it comes to opposing Zionism, we're back in the majority like it was before the Holocaust. We are back in the majority the Jewish anti-Zionists. We're still having issues with calling out aristocrats. And it's, we're not, we don't have a problem calling out the Jewish bourgeoisie. I've noticed that. Like the Jewish bourgeoisie it pisses off everybody, um, especially because they're usually the under the under um, the uh, the 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 underlings of you know uh, of French colonialists and, and, and British financiers and 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 you know um, German economists, you know, and everybody can see it. And and these people are like the most disdetached from Jewishness that you get, you know. But dealing with Jewish aristocrats is, is something a lot of Jewish people still don't want to deal with. And I I'm, I would make I would say, who do you think boycotts Dr. Weisfeld all the time? Jewish aristocrats are doing that. Um, but it's something that has to be confronted, you know, and Islam does confront their reactionaries. I give them full credit for that. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it could be very hard to calm down their anger over this is they've been calling out their reactionaries forever. You know, like, you know, even some of the quote uh, jihadist groups have turned over a new leaf in certain areas like Hamas. I used to really look down on Hamas and, and, but I mean, and I have to give full credit to Dr. Weisfeld for this. He educated me on Hamas and Hamas improved their line. And a lot of people don't know this, but they improved their positions because of Dr. Weisfeld. And that is actually how respected Dr. Weisfeld is. And yet he remains boycotted. It's very, very not mysterious. It, it, it does look like there's an aristocrat collaboration um, going on here. I mean, Jason Unruh, for instance, wouldn't have to deal with worrying about his platform being under threat if it wasn't for the fact that the aristocrats do control a center-left narrative, uh, which which also is suspiciously white. You know, like I had a, I have, I've had my disagreements with Dead Man, but like, I, I had to tell Dead Man, you know what? Your whole thing about the white hegemony on the left, I, I see it now. It's absolutely there. It is a completely white dominated space, you know. Um, and, you know, that's another thing I will say. Jeffrey Marsh is white. What Jeffrey Marsh is doing is white. You know, there's, no, there's nothing post-white about Jeffrey Marsh. Jeffrey Marsh is white. Jeffrey March is whiter than sour cream. Jeffrey <laughs> March is probably a predator from the way it looks. I mean, like I, like you, I, I cannot be quite sure, but there's something off about this, you know. And the the hyping up of things, you know, like I don't know how I feel about no contact, but I can understand the necessity for a lot of people to maintain no contact. And if no contact no contact has an argument. They, you know, Je Jeffrey Marsh, that this person is 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 going to make that difficult to continue, you know, that argument. And, and that's what I hope people in the trans community consider is that Jeffrey Marsh not only is not helping, Jeffrey Marsh is making everything worse right now. And to all my Muslim brothers and sisters, I, as somebody who has been in consistent contact with the trans community, I can promise you Jeffrey does not represent this community. Um, and, and if anything else you want to say about this. Yeah, I, I've basically one of the things that I kind of feel is that they're kind of like how there is really not only just the Islamic community or the Judeo community, but just any community in general is that you're going to have, you know, 
your individuals that are, you know, very sound minded and understand that, you know, certain people are problematic, um, whether that's because of, you know, pedophilia, whether that's because they're just reactionary. And that's something that, you know, I think that all, you know, that all communities have to face at some point. Um, Jeffrey basically represents what I would call the trans aristocracy and the, or the non-binary aristocracy, whatever you want to refer to that as, which sounds almost like an oxymoron, but let's be real here. There are lumpen trans people, there are bourgeois and aristocratic trans people, just because a certain group of people, you know, face oppression and, you know, are, you know, a minor, you know, a gender minority doesn't mean that they don't have, that they cannot be part of a bourgeois or, you know, aristocratic, you know, class. Jeffrey very much gives off the impression of, I don't like, I don't know how much the, this person makes, but definitely it's probably more, you know, more than me. But that being said, it's like this person also very much, as you said, is um, white and, you know, very, comes from a very major position of privilege. And they are using that privilege to, to essentially harm, uh, you know, harm others. In this case, potentially, you know, children, teenagers, you know, and that's the pro and, and that's the thing that we as in the trans community need to be able to stand up and fight back against because in a lot of ways, yes, I feel like there isn't enough trans people. For me personally, um, uh, there is um, a couple of in individuals that I follow, um, one of which I actually have talked with Net about is um, an individual that I follow on YouTube called Mama Max. And Mama Max is basically um, a YouTuber that makes content in which he exposes pedophiles. He exposes, uh, he's basically what I would like to call a vigilante, Chris Hansen. Um, and while Mama Max isn't a leftist, I don't really know what Mama Max's political views are, and I really honestly don't care. Um, the point is, is that he calls out these, these people and exposes them for who uh, who they really are. In fact, um, one of his more recent ones that he did last year was um, a predator that was actually um, just over the river, that was living over the river in um, Vancouver, Washington, because of Mama Max's um, uh, documentary that, um, that he put on YouTube. This individual ended up um, fleeing to Mexico, and then people found out where he, he was staying, and um, basically police caught up with him, and, um, you know, that person was brought to justice, and will hopefully end up, um, you know, serving time for their crime. Um, and that is what we as the trans community should, you know, I'm not saying we should exactly all go out being vigilantes on the world like Mama Max, but I do believe that we need to start being more like Mama Max and actually calling out these people, calling out these, you know, these predators. It doesn't matter whether they're cis or trans. It doesn't matter if they're you know, gay or straight. A predator is a predator and they need to be called out. I understand 
there's a lot of stigma that's going around um, within, uh, you know, about the gay community, about the trans community, about the, you know, and accusations being thrown back and forth between the gay and trans community. And, you know, especially when you consider organizations like the LGB Alliance, which, you know, I could do an entire video about that on its own. But my biggest issue is just the fact that there's just not enough people that are willing, necessarily not willing, I guess, but are, I guess there's too many people that are afraid to speak out about these issues for fear that they might be bringing on, you know, that more stigma to the trans community or that they're just, um, and that they're uh, base or basically having it misconstrued that, Oh, well, you're a trans person, but you're saying that this, you know, that this person is, you know, a pedophile. Therefore you, you, you know, you must be getting on board with that whole, you know, groomers thing. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying, we're not saying, we're not saying that we're just saying this particular person or, you know, this small group of people within the trans community are a problem and they need to be dealt with accordingly. That's, you know, again, and this goes back to the whole self critique of ourselves, of our community, and having to realize, look, we we do have certain people that are a problem. How are we going to deal with that? You know, so we, and the only way we're going to get to that solution is by talking about it and by calling out these people. So if anything, that's what I'm desperately asking my fellow trans people to do is in this sort of case we have a person jeffrey marsh who is a problematic person because they are you know working with children and they are very much very suspicious and you know pretty much forming what i believe is a cult around them that that is very sus to me and it needs and it whether they're guilty of of an actual of actual crimes that that's you know that's that's yeah it's that part's i'm not going to say not important because it is important but it's it's really the fact that this person is very, is just very problematic and they need to, to be called out on it. It needs to be addressed. The, the Jeffrey needs to address these issues themselves. And, you know, if they are actually, you know, preying on children then they need to be brought to justice. They need they need to be dealt with. And we as the trans community really need to stand up and say something about it. And if that means that it's, you know, just a few people like myself, so be it. Yes, thank you for um, weighing in on that the way that you, you did. And um, you said something that... Um, I agree with completely. A predator is a predator. You know, the predators do not, they are not precise to any one religion or even lack thereof. There are atheist predators. I, I know that there's a, like a rad lived notion that there's not. There are, they, being a predator knows no, uh, is not precise to any sexual orientation, religiosity ethnicity, class even. Um, I am proud to say, though, in the lump of proletariat, we do terrible things to our pedophiles. We destroy them. We mess them up. <laughs> pedophiles don't survive prison for a reason. <laughs> um, but it is it, a predator is a predator regardless. 
Um, and if Jeffrey, I hope Jeffrey's not watching this because like, I definitely don't look forward to being dogpiled by a bunch of gender warriors that they may send this way. But if Jeffrey is watching this, you are obligated to explain yourself. Um, because there is something very suspect with the way that you've been dealing with your platform. And um, if you can think you can mess with me or Nicole, you're barking up the wrong tree here. <laughs> um, so I don't have much more to say, except that we should combat both transphobia and Islamophobia. Um, I, I'll tell you this, when I, I became a Bundist because I wanted, because being Jewish has become a civil rights issue in Arizona, and probably a lot more of the Southwest than just Arizona. Um, I agreed to get on board with this because I wanted to make Bundism safer for Orthodox Jews, because the old Bund was not very understanding. Um, to be fair, though, um, Orthodox Judaism was not very understanding to the Bund either. Once you get into physical reality and you realize that socialism applies to the material conditions that you're dealing with and no other concept other than socialism deals with it, um, it becomes a frustrating uphill battle to speak to communities who are only used to dealing with Western communists like the CPUSA and the PCUSA and, and what that all entails and the bad reputation that the Soviet Union got to be fair mostly through ridiculous slander propaganda to be fair um but you know um being a demarchist we are a continuation yes of the non-alignment movement but the non-alignment movement we, we look back and we understand the problem with the non-alignment movement but the non-alignment movement wouldn't happen if, if it wasn't for the western chauvinism that started to emerge in the soviet blocs the western uh the, the sorry the warsaw pact um, and so now if you think about that after the Cold War and you think about today and how difficult it is to explain socialism, as time is going by, the Muslims are seeing, for instance, that the left actually cares. Even Orthodox Jewish people are realizing, oh, the left actually cares. And, and we don't we don't leave that destroyed by Jeffrey or anybody else like Jeffrey. You know, the world is coming of, to a coming of age. And as the world is coming of age, we cannot rely exactly only on the Internet. We have to start reaching out to each other. The Internet has been a great tool to start this with. But as it centralizes, we have to think beyond the Internet. And we have to think about, you know, coexistence. None of us can bemoan our oppressions by just speaking of it to our our little echo chambers silently we have to be willing to show courage and that's the reality we're in jerusalem was declared the capital of israel by donald trump there are laws being passed that are precisely transphobic and homophobic it's only a matter of time i think until same-sex marriage is abolished i don't think that the overturn. I don't think Roe versus Wade is going to be restored. I think we have to face the reality of what we are in. You know, um, some would say that the Falcon General and um, my own child, Corporal Cat, are a little bit too extreme by saying we're at global fascism, but I'm starting to see it their way, actually. I think we are yeah, at global fascism. Um, I have no problem. I'm one of the ones that have no problem using the term globalist because I know what it actually means. Uh, globalism is the cooperative imperialist network, which um, brings together colonialism, neocolonialism, fascism, all into a, a new type of um, imperialism. It's still imperialism, but it's a type. It's the type of imperialism that we have a hard time identifying because it's it's. It, 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 it's a networked imperialism like like we haven't seen since the time of globalization there's been a war on collective memory um i mean i think i think um piper Tompkins said this on uh, luke dublin's channel i think recently uh that, that 
uh, you know, we have to look back at Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan because there was a collective purging of memory that occurred. Liberal never meant left wing until Ronald Reagan. You know, and if if we are looking back at history, I mean, the, why why is there so much popularity to the Black Panthers now? You know, that didn't just happen for no reason. It's because people started to remember what happened. You know, and you find out that oh, the war on colonialism is a leftist thing. Oh, the position that guns are good for the poor is a leftist thing. Oh, gun control really is right wing, you know, and that's why they're centralizing the internet because there's a panic. But because of the fact that they're centralizing the internet, we cannot rely on the internet. We can only start reaching out to each other and start forming real networks of resistance, um, which that's going to lead to a lot of things. But it's, it, it, it's like this. Um, Worry about your own family. Worry about your own community only has 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 is what is what allowed for these totalitarian um, measures and these autocratic measures to come up the way that they are. It it, it has been the silence that did this. Yes, Jewish people um, were the anti-Zionists of us. We are back in the majority, but we couldn't stop. But but we but we but, and yet we couldn't stop Donald Trump. Um, from declaring Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And that means that individuals like myself had been correct the whole time. We are sitting on our ass here. You know, and one or two people are not going to cut it. Like, it has to be in droves. And, you know, if one or two, you know, like, start off, that's fine, as, as Nicole said. But I, I'm of the position we all have to start confronting the the ills in our groups because they don't speak for us. Like, like I said before, you know, uh, we still have a thing where people don't want to call out Jewish aristocrats, but it is Jewish aristocrats that have boycotted Dr. Weisfeld. It is an aristocrat issue that's done this. Um, we have still a problem with Zionists. We still have a problem with um, a Jewish people who do not believe that any other oppression other than Jewish oppression is relevant, even though that completely negates the Torah itself. But, but I digress. We, uh, we need to think about rainbow coalitions like Fred Hampton. We need to think about united fronts. And yes, that does not mean every breed of socialist is valid. I will maintain that, you know, um, things like dangism are not valid. Um, in fact, I still owe people a self-criticism for, you know, um, uh, helping the MRM network conclude that maybe we should for a while at least be soft on the dangus. That is, I, I own up to that. That was more my, my doing. Um, there's a lot of shit I get blamed for. That's not my fault, but there are certain things that I definitely have to take responsibility for. And when I, the reason why I'm saying this is that you're going to find that in the leftist sphere, it isn't going to be about Marxists or anarchists. It is going to be more about tendencies, whether you like it or not, because we, if you think about it across the board, socialism has to mean war on capitalism. And, and in, in a country like the United States, it has to mean decolonization. So if people want to reach communism, you do have to get to socialism first because, you know, you know, to this day, black and white are not equal together in South Africa because of the economic issue. And the laws are actually going back into favor of white people. I know you hear about this bullshit white genocide. Nah, it's the reverse. White power is rising again in South Africa. And this time they have neo-colonial friends that look like the oppressed on their side, which... It's also why I say neocolonialism really is worse than colonialism. Zionism is a form of neocolonialism. That doesn't make it less of an oppression. That makes it more of an oppression, actually. And neocolonialism has different modes. It has the economic mode. It has the cultural mode. And, you know, when you, when you think about all this in scope, um, we have to call out the problems within our communities because they don't represent our communities. But people are likely to think they do if we are silent and silence is condonance and i i would like to salute you <laughs> for your bravery um um and that as i told you before like from what i saw in the mrm network you were all you were always universally loved there's just been there's a problems that they have to sort out with that i can't help with you know like you know like if i tried to help more with that network i would just be holding them back and i really want that network to flourish um, because you have solid people in there, you know, like Jason Andrew, 
you know, himself, the big man himself, but you have Luke Dublin, you have Kara, um, that's the Stone Soviet, if anybody knows who I'm talking about, uh, the Falcon General. Dark Snowby is solid, you know? Um, there's another guy in there now, a lump in Kelt. Um, you know, I'd like to see that network thrive because we, we, we have to rely on leftist press, but leftist press needs to decolonize itself, I think, because, you know, I'll tell you one thing as a Jewish person, it's very isolating to even speak of your own references because like I speak of the patriarch Abraham, oh, you're for this male chauvinist patriarchy now. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff I have to deal with. Um, there, we are seeing a very interesting parallel between transphobia and Judeophobia, you know? And I think it's because we're the two marginalized groups that actually have some ability to interface but we have, but the more privilege any of us have, the more responsible we are to do stuff. I'm not the most privileged Jewish person. I'm actually on the lower ends of it, but I'm at the top of the lower ends, and I've been conscious of this for a while. Most of the Jewish people who are at the bottom gutter, like myself, are not in my position. I may be in a precarious position, but that is not an excuse not to use whatever means I have to do something about the problems we have the problems that you know are done in our name not just again not just because of zionists but even yes jewish aristocrats do you have any more closing statements here um no i think you've pretty much uh, kind of hit a lot of it on the head um just yeah no i'm just really glad that i could come on here and you know be able to if you know if anything provide a plea to the trans community to you know and to the L, just the lgbt community in general that you know there you know there there are people out here that you know that are willing to stand up to you know combat uh pedophilia and you know or any sort of problematic individual that's out there but we need to collectively stand up and uh, push these and push these people, you know, out and and basically make a statement that they do not represent us because, but you know, because by not doing so, it really does make us look bad, and we already face enough stigma as it is, in, you know, in today's society. Um, and um yeah i just you know we we need to stand we really do need to stand together um as i've you know told people you know people you know many many times in fact i've recently just had a major uh dis debate with certain people with it that i would consider to be the trans bourgeois uh part of the community is we need to not only arm ourselves with knowledge but we need to arm ourselves to you know for our own protection and that you know so it, it's one of those things where it's like to anybody that's watching that is from the lgbt community you can't stand idle on the sidelines forever you cannot you know you cannot basically just keep voting for the democrats hoping that things are going to get better you cannot you know just ignore problems within our community you know and pretend like they don't exist because they very much do these are problems that we do face and these are problems that we must address so you know what but you know with all that said yeah <laughs> uh i would definitely uh like to just double back on that one uh last thing that uh, comrade net was mentioning about globalism um the only comment i needed to make on that was it's uh globalism especially in this day and age is um you know just a product of the you know, global rise of fascism, which as Lenin himself stated, 
fascism is capitalism in decay. And we are seeing capitalism decaying, you know, more and more rapidly as the years go by. And that is what is contributing to a lot of this um, Islamophobia, transphobia, and just the global rise of fascism in general. And we have to, as a community, you know, both as, you know, within our own communities and as a, you know, collective community in general, we have to take a stand, you know, we, we actually need to take a stand. And we, you know, there's no sitting on the sidelines anymore. You either are for fascism or you're against fascism. Plain and simple. Thank you, everybody who uh, watched. Uh, please share this with everybody. This will be, this is not my last stream, but I will, I'm very busy with um, things that are difficult to, and I, and I don't want to say too much because I, let's just say that I have adversaries that are paying too much attention to me right now. And uh, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you for being here. <laughs> no problem. But um, yeah, long live Antifa, long live anti-fascist action, down with colonialism, down with fascism, down with radical liberalism. Solidarity, comrades. Solidarity. <laughs>